So next this afternoon we have Niamh Shunhe, uh, who is a, a writer, a game maker, and a critic from Chicago, and is indubitably your fox mom. <laughs> she has written for publications such as Zeal and Zam, and her game Tea Ceremony was a Game Chef 2015 finalist. Much of her work focuses on issues of care, both care for others and care for oneself, and often belies her deep interest in things outside of games, including food, history, music, and folklore. And we are going to gain an insight into one of Neo's interests uh, this afternoon Ooh. with her talk, oh dear, <laughs> about cute games. Please welcome Neo. Hello, can you hear me? Is this on? Hello? Yeah, I think okay. it's working. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, this perhaps somewhat deceptive title, Cute Games, <laughs> um, because you'll, as you'll find out, I'm using cute in a, a far more conceptual way than you maybe normally do. Um, and I'm specifically talking about this Icelandic notion of krut, uh, which is primarily applied to a musical movement, although, as we'll find out, it's not solely music. Um, and the point of it is to sort of try to understand how we're approaching revolution and resistance in all queer games. Um, because I think often the, the thing that we use as comparison is punk rock. Um, so yeah, here's Y Krut. And my other answer to Y Krut is why not? Uh, you should look out at things outside of games to figure out what you're doing in games. Uh, but I also understand that there are many things that we can look at. And so why specifically this? It is that punk, game, punk is often what we try to look to, to understand how we're doing resistance, these ideas of do it yourself, um, these ideas of sort of pushing back. And uh, this is a great piece by Zoe Quinn, who uh, was on a panel, a very good panel yesterday. Um, I'm not knocking this piece or anything. Um, I'm just saying this is, I think, a main framework that we're trying to use to understand uh, alt games and queer games right now. Um, and then at the same time, uh, there's also this push towards cuteness as an aesthetic. Uh, this is a piece by Lee Alexander about sort of a specific aesthetic cyber twee, uh, but also like critic Danielle Riendo uh, often talks about the neo-endearment movement or the neo-endearment crew, this idea of sort of uh, friendliness and cuteness and endearment being important. Um, and so hopefully this talk will help you see how we get from punk to this aesthetic, but still maintaining this idea of resistance uh, and revolution. Um, I do have a few caveats that I would like to bring up. Uh, the first, although different than Latin America, Iceland is a post-colonial nation. Um, it was a colony of Denmark, and Denmark treated it very poorly. And it basically got uh, freedom during World War II when there was a U.S. Army base that was put there because it was deemed important for military. Um, and so there's a lot of fear in Iceland that Danish colonialism has sort of just given way to this new, more insidious American colonialism. Um, and there is a lot of uh, exoticization and fetishization that happens with Icelandic culture and music in the United States, and I want us to try to avoid doing that. Um, it, what they are doing is just as complex and nuanced as what we're doing in all queer games, and I don't want us to reduce it down into some uh, exotic fetish. Um, the other thing is that many young Icelanders who have had the label crew applied to them actively reject it, and I'll get more into this why, uh, why later, um, but it's important to know that this is actually a label that is widely rejected a lot. Um, and the main reason why I'm using it is that there is just no other one term that I can give you to latch on to, uh, to discuss what's happening. Mm -hmm. And the other reason is that, uh, personally, I sort of grew up very interested in Icelandic music and culture at the same time that Krut was happening. And I understand that I had some distance being in America at the time, uh, but it was a label that actually I took on because it helped me sort of deal with queerness and these ideas of, uh, embracing my own cuteness. So I'm of the mind that there's no, nothing wrong with being cute, but there are many Icelanders who disagree. Um, 
So ultimately, this should be a point of comparison. This shouldn't be something that we are appropriating or directly copying. Um, it's more to understand what we're already doing. So I'm going to give you a crash course in the history of Icelandic music. And as all crash courses, it's going to be incredibly reductive. Um, for example, I'm going to skip hundreds of years of history and go right to the 1980s, uh, which is when punk rock happened. That's why I'm skipping here, because that's the, the jumping off point that we need. And I want to talk about sort of the evolution of punk to Krut. Uh, so punk really took off in Reykjavik during the uh, early 1980s. And it was best documented by this film, Raki Reykjavik, uh, which is sort of maybe incorrectly titled because it was punk, not rock. Um, but uh, so this was produced for television um, and covered a lot of the bands. You can sort of see small a lot of the names there. Um, what's interesting is that these images are very similar to what was used in the very early VHS uh, release of it as well. Again, it was originally for television. And it's front, it's like putting Björk here. Uh, that's a young Björk. And then this other woman who I believe she was the singer for Q4U, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but it was actually, at the time, still quite male-dominated, despite the fact that he's sort of putting these women forward. There were a few well-known women, and they were quite popular, uh, but it was actually primarily uh, male-dominated. And uh, so I'm going to play a clip from, um, I actually should have made a little bit of an announcement before. Uh, it's from a documentary, and there is a man wearing like a flaming suit. Uh, one of those suits were going to be on fire, so if that's... Uh, like upsetting for you leave. Also, there's going to be a part where they're somewhat referencing like the images of Insane Asylum in another clip. Um, and this is something I think Kroot moved beyond, but I just want to put that forward. Um, so this is from a documentary. It starts with a clip from Rocky Reykjavik, and then there's some interviews where they're actually talking. Uh, I think it was produced in like 2005 or six, uh, more about the punk movement. And uh, Egil Skalgrimsson was a uh, sort of a like old Norse, like around 1100, I think, uh, like Viking poet. Um, and one thing I think is interesting about this clip, and I'll get back to as well, is that they are hearkening back to these really old Icelandic forms in this documentary where they're talking about punk rock. Um, they're going to this, this form is called Rimir, which is a kind of reciting poetry. Um, so, uh, this is sort of the main period, of the heyday of punk rock, uh, which is 1980 to 1983 in Iceland. Um, and it wasn't really content with imitating or repeating sort of what was popular in America or Europe at the time, which a lot of music in Iceland sort of prior to this would be whatever was popular in the US or, Amer or uh, Europe, but like a couple years later. 
Um, and this is sort of referencing earlier punk rock, but I feel like it's actually more akin to what was concurrently happening in the post-punk movement in New York. So if you're familiar with uh, especially Sonic Youth and Talking Heads, I think are some of the bigger bands, but also like uh, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, James Chance and the Contortionists, uh, Glenn Branca, a lot of them are sort of doing something else. And it, it is this surrealist thing that uh, Sion, who's a like poet and author, uh, was talking about. Um, also, a lot of the people who were creating this would be what would sort of be called camp scum. They were living in the old army bases that were left behind by the, the US military after World War II um, and were sort of viewed as lesser by a lot of Icelandic society because they had been Americanized to a degree. Um, and so they were responding to sort of the socio-political climate um, with their like surrealist punk rock was how they were expressing the frustration of sort of being these poor kids. Um, and I think trying to take something American but uh, repackaging it into something they could call their own. And this led to Smeklesa, which means bad taste. Uh, it was a record label, and it was formed in 1986 to, uh, this is Sikir Malarnir, better known in the United States as the Sugar Cubes, uh, Bjork's band. And in order to release this uh, EP, they sold these postcards commemorating the meeting of uh, Reagan and Gorbachev. <laughs> um, and they also, the other two things, so at the same time they released this poetry book, uh, Drag Suger, which means drafts, although interestingly, I don't know exactly when this started in Icelandic, this term is also now used to mean drag show, uh, because Suger means like a free environment, um, so drag, like free environment, drag show, uh, but I don't know when that started because I've only seen references uh, to it sort of in the 2000s. Um, and then also this other poetry book, Talk to Benzine El Elskin, which is often translated as Take Some Petrol, Darling. Petrol being like gasoline. Um, and also they re released books by Sion, that poet who was in the uh, music video or the documentary clip. So here's another clip from the documentary. It's called Screaming Masterpiece, where they're talking a little bit more about the sugar cubes. <laughs> sem gerist er það að að þeir sem að komu svona úr úr þessu rokki Reykjavík dæmi það stendur á þeim tíma nóttum að annaðkvart ætla að halda áfram að vera listamenn eða það ætla að ganga inn í samfélagið og ætla að halda áfram að 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 gera list sem að væri ill höndlanlega og ill skilanlega þá dettur okkur í huga hvort að væri ekki sniðugt að búa til eina popphljóðsveit sem að myndi fylgja eftir stefnu og stefnu og markmiðu um smekkleins, sem sagt að heims yfir á þeim dauði og sem sagt að reyna að spila eitthvað sem að væri alls okkur ókomt eða sem sagt pottlónist og taka þá á þeirri fóbíu, þeirri hræðslu sem við höfðum um gagnvar sko pottlónist og ef okkur fannst pottlónist sem við höfðum að hópa smekkleins þá hvernig myndum við ekki að setja sama fordæmi og myndum bara að sigra heimi Heims yfir á þeim það dauði úrdrættur og stefnisk Fyrsta grein, þar er góðu smekkur og sparnaður, eru höfuð óvinnur sköpunar og venniðunar, mun smekkleis SMS-er vinna markvist gegn öllu sem flokkast undir góðan smekk og sparnaður. So, that was a small sample of the manifesto that they released, which was world domination or death, and this sort of took a Dadaist turn from their more early surrealism. Uh, they became far more interested in the absurd and uh, sort of, um, like I say here, focused less on resistance as negation, sort of we're going to do the opposite, but rather ironically reappropriating mainstream um, and subverting it. And at this time too, because of the popularity of the Sugar Cubes perhaps and of Björk, there was a large explosion of uh, women as singers, band leaders, and also all women bands. Um, so I'll far more showed up. There were a lot of uh, male-centered bands, too, who, like, sort of at the worst, they were just trying to find a female singer, hoping they could cash in on popularity. <laughs> uh, but there were also a lot of all-women bands at this time. Um, and then this is sort of transitioning into Krut now. In 1999, uh, the label Smeklesa publishes this album, Augaitis Birgen, by Sieros. Uh, you may recognize that name. This album is still rec uh, regarded as one of the uh, 
best Icelandic albums ever created, and at least in my opinion, is sort of the starting point of Krut. Um, so I'm just going to play a little bit of this music video, um, turn down the volume a little bit. Uh, this is from one of the songs from uh, that album. And uh, I specifically chose this one because the lyrics are sort of uh, hinting at it, and the, the music video makes it very explicit that the lyrics are about the singer Yonzi's uh, difficulties growing up as gay in Iceland before it became sort of more accepting of queer identities. Um, and so these two boys that you're seeing in, in the plot of the music video are in love and basically get torn away when kissing on like a football soccer field. Um, but I'll, I'll let the music play a little bit just so you can kind of hear some of the... Um, so Rose in particular is well known for the, like, the very swelling sounds. Um, so what exactly is Krut? Uh, the term was first applied by this critic, uh, Gertrude Christie, in November of 2002. Uh, she was doing an interview with the bam, uh, band Moom, which is also somewhat well-known in the United States. You may have heard of them. Um, and she used it sort of derisively. Uh, she was asking some honestly kind of stupid questions to them, and they were giving equally stupid answers. So the one that she specifically cites is why she did Krut. She asked them what their favorite meal was, and one of them said, chocolate cake with milk. Um, and she thought that this was like a ridiculous answer. But often the, the Krut artists... Uh, would sort of refuse to take part in sort of the ridiculousness of like interviews and all of this um, and so that's why they were sometimes criticized in this way. Um, it directly translates probably to cute although you would never use it in the sexy sense. Uh, you would never say cute in like a sexy way. Uh, that word is sight instead of crute. Um, it's more of like a childish cute. There's a certain precoci uh, precociousness uh, or comfortableness, or I think twee is probably a very good way to translate it and get some of the nuance. Um, this is from uh, a quote from the musical historian Dr. Gooney, um, where he was trying to explain to an Icelandic audience what Krut was, and he said, uh, it is comfy and most of all testosterone-less. Um, so there is this sort of sense, and he's very supportive, actually, of Krut. This is not, like, critical from his uh, point of view. Um, I think he thinks that this is actually a very good thing about Krut, is that it's not sort of obsessed with the masculinity uh, that is so often expressed in punk in this very toxic way. Um, and then often it is applied, uh, especially when it's being sort of derisive, in, as Krutkinslothen, the cute generation, or I've seen translated as the lovebirds generation, although I don't know where they got lovebirds from. Um, but then it has parallels with the way that people will say millennials, where they're kind of just talking about how they hate young people. And so I think that's why a lot of people, a lot of young people in Iceland don't like this word, is because as millennials, we don't really have an objection to the idea of millenniums or something. We have an objection to how they're using it to describe us. Um, and so here are a few quotes. Uh, some people, though, might dismiss it as crude. Uh, this is a person talking about one of his bands, uh, which is a label that's been put on a certain generation here in Iceland that's making music and other kinds of art. People who, perhaps, share and portray a certain kind of innocence and friendliness. Or not. It's always a bit weird to label music like that. Many people label our music as crude, but no one really knows what that means. But we definitely called this definition upon ourselves when we held a musical festival last year, which was 2005 at the time that he was speaking, uh, that was called Krut. The aim with that festival was really to kill the definition that was made up by the media, but the media just did not get the joke, uh, so they used it more than ever. Um, and then this is Olaf Arnolds, who's sort of made a name uh, for herself as an independent artist. She was also a member of uh, Moom for a number of their albums. I think she's returned on their latest album. Um, I sometimes think that this concept, Krut, is a reductive prefix for a group of artists that have done very well and have been extremely productive. Of course, this is a fashion and mentality movement, which is uh, a certain type of revolution, even though it's not in the form of a slap to society. This is a more quiet uprising, and I'm going to return to quiet uprising again. Um, 
drink some water. So now I'm going to suddenly bring in queer uh, because I want to make sure we're all on the same page of how I'm talking about queer and how I think crew is queer. Uh, if you were at the opening speech, uh, opening sort of panel, and Bonnie talked about the bubble um, that Naomi Clark had talked about, the, it came from, I was at the like original keynote from this passage from the beginning of uh, Jose Esteban Muna's uh, Cruising Utopia. Uh, his description of queerness, the bubble, sort of a good metaphor of the thing that you can see shimmering before you but can't touch. Uh, but here's what he has to say. Uh, we may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. Queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. The aesthetic, especially the queer aesthetic, frequently contains blueprints and schemata of a forward dawning futurity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the crew aesthetics uh, specifically. And I may actually skip this uh, one just for the sake of time, unless you really want to see it. But uh, with this one is essentially uh, this guy making like a marimba out of stones. Um, we have 10 minutes left for the session. Okay, I may, I may let it play then if there's 10 minutes still. Or so yeah, there is this sort of interest in like uh, handmade or unique things. Um, and also, again, I think this is sort of tying back to this idea of like the, both the past and then moving forward into something new, because these are old rocks um, from like sort of lava flows. And then this one I'll play and also talk over. But so that's sort of a specific like strange instrument that this guy made that the band uh, Cirros uses sometimes. Uh, this one are perhaps slightly more conventional instruments, but I'm going to play and talk. Um, so the, the girl sort of on the far end there is playing this like toy keyboard to make that really beeping sound. And then this is a musical saw, which is a ancient, like traditional instrument in Iceland. Um, and she's doing it to make that sort of almost synthy uh, pulsing sound. Um, and then there's also someone playing a lap harp. Uh, I'm not sure if she's actually come in yet, the like sound of it, but it's another traditional Icelandic music uh, instrument. And then someone playing, yeah. And then also someone playing um, a xylophone at a certain point. Um, and so it's interesting to me that so this traditional instrument, they're making it almost sound digital when they have this very uh, chintzy or like um, this like toy instrument that they're playing um, along with this musical saw and it, it begins to blur the line between these traditional instruments and these like new instruments. Um, and so I only have one slide that actually shows uh, games on it, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about what's in the arcade. Uh, so here is uh, a game, Clitar, that is this thing that you hold that's like a giant guitar or something, um, and you're trying to find these buttons on it to press, but there's all this fuzzy stuff, but it's sort of this like handmade uh, yarn thing, uh, but that is also sort of this weird new game. Uh, there's also Beeswing, which is sort of a documentary game about uh, this old town, and it uses this like very uh, hand-drawn uh, sort of watercolory or like crayony look, but it is a digital game that you can play. Um, and so I think within like queer and all game spaces, we are also playing with this idea of time and like using old crafts and things to create new things. Um, and I also wanted to just bring up. Uh, so, like, like camping is out there. I think it's another thing that definitely fits into this. Uh, the truly terrific traveling troubleshooter. Um, 
and then also sort of physical games, but that have these very like handmade aesthetics to the graphics. Uh, Ritual of the Moon and Dominique Pomplamoose and Dominique Pomplamoose in Combinatorial Explosion, um, I think are all sort of fitting in. So hopefully you're beginning to see sort of connections between Crute and queer games. Um, I'm also going to play this and talk over it. Um, this is the band Pasco Pinin. Um, oh, sounds like the audio may have cut out. Um, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so they they have a, both of them are quite accomplished as musicians, but sort of as their band um, and their twin sisters, uh, the inspiration of the band is that they actually remember like hearing their mother practice music when they were in the womb. They have like this vague memory. And so they're trying to re recreate this like very dreamy and imperfect sound. Uh, so they're sort of embracing imperfection a lot in how they play music, um, which I think has parallels to, there's a lot of expression of being against polish uh, in alt games, in queer games, that the idea of polish is sometimes sort of destructive to actually creating something um, that is like heartfelt or meaningful to you. And then uh, this is Florals from Annie Mock, which is a comic, but she also made it into a game. Um, and then this is the artist Sin Fang, um, and he also sort of does visual arts as well as music. Um, I had some audio that he was playing, but it doesn't yeah, seem to be working to be either. Um, so to finish off, uh, Crute, again, A Quiet Uprising. Um, so I'm going to do sort of the comparison. Uh, punk rock is sort of this aggressive, reactive, uh, contrary, abrasive form of resistance. Uh, it is resistance as antithesis, rejection, negation. Um, and the goal is to overtly disrupt or make discordance. Uh, the idea of like being discordant is very um, core to punk, and they want it to sound unpleasant to you when there is discord. Uh, Crute is more focused on the imperfect, being precocious, strange, and then queer. I'm using the word again. This is sort of the uh, conceptual one that I talked about. Um, although there are also LGBT members in the Crute community, but they're not all. Um, so this is resistance as instead of uh, sort of antithesis or rejecting, it is moving beyond the current state to something new. Uh, while often incorporating the things that you find appealing or worthwhile in the past. Um, and sometimes those are things that may have been, like a lot of the instruments that the crew is using, are things that people might say are like not good instruments. Uh, there are a lot of these sort of toy instruments, um, like lap harps. And so the goal is to reclaim wrongness as beautiful, rather than to just sort of say, we're going to be wrong because you say it's wrong, and I'm like in your face, is instead saying, what is wrong is actually its own kind of beauty, and that's what we're more interested in than what you're sort of telling us is beautiful. Um, and so lastly, I have a few lessons from Crute. These are sort of for uh, creators in particular. So one, there's a high level of collaboration in uh, Crute music. Pretty much everyone plays in everyone else's band. Uh, if you follow the music at all, you'll find that whatever band you like, there are like 10 other bands that are made up of members from that band that you like. Um, and they often work across genres uh, and also across media. So I already referenced that a little bit, but they will like one artist may be doing a folk album, an R&B album. Um, they're very interested in just sort of jumping around. And I'll, I think a lot of this comes from the high level of collaboration that they have. Also, they support each other a lot as a community. Uh, they share resources. There's a lot of uh, promotion of each other. I think the high level of collaboration makes that easy as well because you can just sort of say, oh yeah, you like us, listen to this other band that people are in. Um, and the last thing is they've built a lot of local spaces. I forgot to mention this, but that the Amina, the one where they're sort of playing the like musical saw, uh, is at an art gallery that they built for like the visual art from Crew. Um, so on the topic of build, lo build local spaces, if anyone is from Chicago and like would like to help me set up a QGCon local in Chicago, tweet at me. Um, I'm interested in doing that, but I need collaborators because I can't do it myself. Um, but yeah, wherever you are, build spaces for creators. Um, and thank you.